I think we should start, yes. Okay. Hello, everyone. Welcome to our another webinar today at FSR Global, whose topic for today is resource adequacy. I'm Amrita, the communications assistant at FSR Global. Just for your information, we are streaming this video live on YouTube, which you can view later as well. Now, I would like to invite Paul Bakshi to take this ahead. Thank you, Amrita. Uh, good morning, good afternoon to everyone present. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, very warm welcome to the EU India Regulatory Workshop series. We're in the sixth cycle of this series um, under the EU CECP, and it is my pleasure to have you all here. And the topic of today's event is resource adequacy, a very timely topic, I feel. And uh, without Further ado, I'd like to call upon uh, Bartosh, who's the councillor, European Union delegation to India, to please open with his remarks. Over to you, Bartosh. Uh, hello, good afternoon to, to everybody. You can hear me, I assume? Yes, good. So uh, thank you very much for inviting me to, to open this workshop. It is uh, it's organized in the frame, framework, as, as, uh, as Paul said, the framework of the large and diversified diversified platform of cooperation between uh, India and the EU. It's called the EU-India Clean Energy and Climate Partnership. And uh, yeah, we have been for conducting this regulatory workshop series in collaboration with FSR Global for the past uh, six years. Um, and this ongoing series of events aims to facilitate discussions on various topics related to clean energy transition, something which is very close to our hearts, both in Europe and uh, and I, I see, I hope, also here in, uh, in India. So today's debate uh, will focus on the topic of uh, resource, resource adequacy. And uh, this, uh, for some people, it may sound quite cryptic, but this expression can be broadly defined in the simplest terms as the ability of a power system to supply enough electricity in the needed time slots and at the right locations, uh, practically to keep the lights on everywhere around the clock during all the year. So uh, this issue is particularly crucial when the system is, the power system is undergoing a fundamental change. Uh, and uh, such a change we see now, it's the, the change in the composition of uh, different energy sources. And in this specific case, it's gradually increasing penetration of renewable energy into the grid. And uh, the topic is of particular importance or relevance today, as the Central Electric Authority of India has just recently issued draft guidelines on resource adequacy, precisely to address this challenge of integrating new sources of renewable ent energy into the, into the grid. And these guidelines aim to ensure a reliable and resilient power system, but at the same time, to promote the efficient use of resources and facilitate the transition to cleaner energy uh, resources. Uh, in the European Union, we know this issue very, very well, not only because we have started integrating renewables already quite a long time ago, but also because we have this constant challenge of integrating, again, integrating together different national grids, different electric electricity systems into one European uh, system. So having in mind all those complexities and challenges, we have built in Europe a very special, sophisticated mechanism, which is called European Resource Adequacy Assessment, which is a pan-European monitoring assessment system, uh, which, which assesses the power system resource adequacy of up to 10 years ahead. It covers all the member states of the European Union, but also other geographically European, but not member states of the, of the EU. Uh, which, of course, they, they, they are members, they are parts of, the, of our power system, such as Switzerland, Norway, uh, and the countries of the Western Balkans. And the system is based on the state-of-the-art methodologies and probabilistic assessments, aiming to model and analyze possible events which can adversely impact the balance between supply and demand of electric power in, in the future. It will be an important element for supporting qualified decisions by policymakers on strategic matters, such as the introduction of capacity mechanism. So while submitting, while discussing the Indian proposals, I'm sure it is worth having at least a quick look at, at what we have done over several years in Europe to ensure the balance and stability of our, uh, of our power system, which is, which is very, very complex and very challenging. 
So with this, uh, with these words, I don't want to take more your time to leave uh, the discussion in the hands of experts. Uh, those experts will present you with the best practices in and innovative solutions in resource planning and management on the way to ensure also a resilient and sustainable energy system for, for India. So I finish here. I wish you a fruitful discussion and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Bartosz. Thank you for perfectly setting the scene. And uh, I think uh, before I begin the panel discussion, I just want every all the participants to know that during the as the panelists share their insights, please feel free to put in your Q&A in the Q&A box, which you can see on your screen. And uh, uh, let me quickly uh, just introduce all the speakers for the day. So we have with us Mr. Prasad, Chairperson, Central Electricity Authority. As Bartosz mentioned, uh, drive, draft guidelines have been put forth by CEA, so it would be interesting to see Mr. Prasad, uh, you know, his insights and comments on uh, resource adequacy. We also with us, uh, we have with us Mr. Suni, former CEO and founder of Asoko, or as we now know it as Grid India. Uh, we have with us Christine, who is assistant professor, Copenhagen School of Energy Infrastructure. Um, we also have uh, Mr. Yasser, uh, who is adequacy modeling specialist at NSOE and also Shweta Ravi Kumar, who's the executive director of FSR Global. So without taking much time, I invite uh, Shweta to please begin by setting the stage and putting forth some questions, uh, which we can carry forward as we begin our discussions. Over to you, Shweta. Thank you, Parul. A very good morning, good afternoon. Uh, I think going after Bartosz, Bartosz very effectively summarized what's happening on both sides of the geography. Uh, but probably I will try to give a little bit more uh, 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 details on, and I hope that the panelists following uh, me will be able to address some of this. I think resource adequacy as a topic has fascinated both engineers and also those of us who are in the field of energy economics uh, equally. Uh, because this topic has been evolving over the last few decades, um, uh, more so now uh, because of uh, more intermittent renewables coming into the system. So uh, or the question uh, or one of the aspects that I would like the panelists to uh, discuss on is uh, how do we go about resource adequacy planning uh, within this energy transition framework with so many new technologies coming in? Uh, predominantly uh, in the previous years, we had resource adequacy more supply heavy planning, but now with the multi-directional flow of uh, electricity, how do we sort of factor this in when we're looking at uh, resource adequacy planning or assessment? Um, then, of course, the second question uh, that does come to geographies, uh, both like India and the European Union, is uh, how do we go about resource adequacy planning? Should it be a centralized or a decentralized approach? Uh, it maybe need not be a question of either or, but how do you sort of have the best optimal mix of the both of these uh, factoring into making sure that we have a security of supply situation uh, at, at a, a country level or at a regional level, uh, be it in the case of Europe? Then, of course, uh, one of the uh, key uh, requirements to be able to make an effective plan is also availability and uh, data transparency. So what has been the experience uh, in, in the European side of uh, uh, things with regards to resource adequacy planning? And how, uh, India has just started to go about this uh, uh, in, 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 since last year. So what can we already uh, anticipate and uh, develop in terms of data transparency platforms in order to be able to effectively plan? And then, of course, last, uh, since we also have Yasser from NSOE, is more on uh, the kind of modeling tools available. And uh, I think uh, it, it's it's exciting uh, from a model uh, uh, development or a tool uh, usage development, because uh, like, like I did mention before, it's not just supply side heavy. So we're not just looking at capacity expansion models, but how to sort of also factor in the networks. And should the resource adequacy planning or assessment of the future also have the component of the market dynamics coming into this uh, as we transition more and more to, to more market-based procurement? So with this, uh, I think I would like to give the floor uh, back to Parul to take us through the panelists, and then uh, probably we'll come back to some of these questions uh, during a discussion as well. Thank you. Thank you, Shweta. So while we might not have all the answers to the questions that Shweta put forth, I think it would be good to kind of uh, see what different perspectives we can bring in in today's discussion. And of course, uh, even the participants, please feel free to put in your comments and question answers. So now, uh, Mr. Prasad, I give the floor to you to please open the discussion. Good afternoon. Good afternoon to everyone. And let me at the outset thank uh, FSR Global uh, to invite me to be a part of this panel, <clears throat> important panel. 
I think the two speakers have really set the tone very beautifully uh, what exactly the the our sector particularly is facing in terms of the resource adequacy. As far as India is concerned, uh, just to give you a small background, uh, yeah, earlier we were not so much focusing on the resource adequacy because we were in a, in a deficit situation. Any resource that was coming and getting integrated into the system was getting absorbed fully, absolutely no issues. Then we realized that since we are in a deficit situation, we need to zero down the deficit and we focused mainly on the resources that were there and the quick addition was there. And we ended up into a surplus situation around four to five years back. This again led to another set of problems, which amounted to some assets, some generation assets getting stressed. And uh, of course, it took us some time to bring them back to, to the thing. But in the meanwhile, what has happened is this has definitely given a negative signal to the investors because of the stress assets. So the, the situation and what we have learned from our own experience is managing deficit in terms of resources, managing surpluses also. In terms of uh, in terms of the situations that the country faced, and that is how you must have seen that last four four years at least we have been trying to focus on an adequacy part of it. That means we don't want a deficit situation, but at the same time we don't want a surplus situation to a larger extent, which leads to a stress condition. And how do we mandate it? Because India itself is almost a replica of European Union. We have a small, small country in the name of the states and their demand is almost equal to the states in the Europe, particularly some of the larger states, whether it is UP, Maharashtra, Gujarat, etc. So we are almost equivalent, I'll say, uh, in, in, the, in terms of the modeling, in terms of the parameters, in terms of the exercises the that we carry out the only difference i see is european countries they attained almost balanced situations a few years back and we have been a bit lagging in in that terms anyway now since we are at almost at par the focus now in india is that we need to have the mechanism so that everybody whoever is responsible for ensuring adequacy of resources are given these responsibilities. And what we could see is it's not only one person who is involved, not only the generators or the, the government, but it's the entire, entire value chain of the, the system which has to be has to be involved in the entire exercise. Normally, as a resource adequacy, we mean that we need to see that the resources, particularly from the supply side, is adequate, and that's it. But then this, this adequacy has also to be seen because ultimate objective is not ensuring the supply side adequacy, but attaining that each and every consumer gets the reliable supply and 24 by 7 quality power, and that's, that's the ultimate aim of the any resource ad adequacy exercises that at least we feel it. And that is how you must have seen that first thing that we mandated is legally mandated is through the rules which was brought in and then to the guidelines that how it has to be done. And in the guidelines, we have given specific responsibility to the distribution companies, to the load dispatching load dispatchers, whether it is SLDCs, RLDCs or NLDCs, so the question that came, I think, was uh, which Sweta rightly pointed out was whether we should go for a centralized or a state wise. The, the philosophy that we have adopted is we will try to ensure both. That means the exercises will be done by the discoms, each discoms as such, because now we have only two, two 
References. One is the distribution company who is or distribution licensee who is supposed to ensure reliable supply to the consumers. And then at the national level, which needs to optimize. I'm sure Europe also must have the similar situations because we in India have two major factors of this optimization and that is the diversity and also the difference in, in, in particularly from the north and south, east and west, there's a time differential of around one and a half hours, number one, which leads us to think in that manner. Then because of the demand pattern differentials between the northern states and the southern part of the country, we need to have that kind of a construct. So using this, what we have thought is it will be done individually. We will ensure individual resource adequacy at the discoms level, optimize it at the national level, and again, give the benefit of this optimization to each and every states depending on their requirement. So that's the approach we'll, we have undertaken. And then this calls for a dynamic approach. That means it cannot be, and in fact, earlier also India were planning uh, and doing that planning exercise, but that was almost like a static planning. We used to make a plan every five years and forget about what is happening in between that uh, five year time period. So what we have now decided is plans will be a rolling plan. That means every year this plan ha will have to be revised by the DISCOMS and by the by the at the national level also. So this is this is one part. And these responsibility, again, the time duration responsibility has also been fixed. That means one year to five years detailed planning and up to 10 years, it is going to be a perspective plan, which will be rolled out every, every year based on the progress that has happened in the previous year. But the uh, resource adequacy from the intraday up to one year will be the responsibility of the load dispatch centers whether it is state within the state, RLDCs, regional load dispatch centers for the region and the national load dispatch centers for the nation as such. Not only that, since we are also connected with the load dispatch centers of the other countries, some in the synchronous mode, some in the asynchronous mode, we have to take care of that, that part as well. So now, since I said that the other players are also involved, so we are also now thinking of ensure adequacy of the transmission network which is again very very important because you might have good resources adequate resources but if it is not transmitted properly then again you will end up into a, a, a mess and this transmission plan again is of the time horizon of five years to ten years this is again rolling this rolling we have already started at the national level and we are dynamically revising it every six months and this is mainly because of the, the, the nature of renewable resources. And particularly that has made us to do it in a faster manner. Because solar, wind, they have the gestation period of anywhere between 18, 18 months to 24 months. If I need storage, say battery storage, it can come within 12 months. So we need that kind of a dynamism in, in this, in the planning of the transmission network, which will facilitate these resources to come in a faster manner. So after covering the transmission adequacy, then we have also given some responsibility to the distribution licenses as well, that you have also to ensure that your network is also adequate enough so that the power is again taken right up to the doorstep of each and every consumers. So entire framework is supposed to be made perfect so that the, the power flows uh, uh, happens and we achieve the objective of giving supply, reliable supply to the, to the consumer. So I'll stop here. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Prasad. Um, I think you gave really good insights into what India is doing, which then sets the stage to again look at also what is happening at the European Union side of things. And I completely agree with you when you say how uh, you know, India kind of reflects the European Union and the member states with the Indian states acting as member countries of the EU, uh, which is why this discussion of today is, I feel, important to see how European Union maneuvered through its journey. But sticking to the Indian perspective for now, I call upon Mr. Suni to, uh, you know, share his viewpoints. 
Yes, Mr. Prasad. One point I think I missed, which yeah. Swetha pointed out. Sorry, sorry for uh, no, go ahead, go ahead, some, some time from Mr. Sony. <laughs> uh, that is, she was telling about the changing nature because of the renewables. And that is the bi-directionality of it. And we are causes of that bi-directionality as well. And that is how the concept of <clears throat> humors you might have seen in some of the literatures of India that we have already introduced the concept of presumers, vehicle to grid, all that concept is coming back. So that, and and smart meeting, focus on the smart meeting. That means we would like the entire grid to be interacting in a bi-directional manner. So far only up to the low dispatch centers, they are talking in a bi-directional manner. From here, we need to really see that the consumer also start talking in that bi-directional manner. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Mr. Soni. Over to you, Mr. Suni. So, <clears throat> thanks, FSR. <clears throat> thanks, uh, esteemed fellow panelists. Mm -hmm. And uh, Mr. Prashad has uh, set the stage. So, uh, let me start with, uh, you know, my experience. I am a rustic operator. And I'm slightly, uh, you know, feeling nervous amongst all the scholarly people here. But I have uh, four decades of uh, uh, tough experience. We started with load generation balance. We used to work on peak and energy. Reliability, reliability every time. Reliability is equal to adequacy plus security. Security for which our heads could roll. So security was taken care of. Adequacy was not there. But we used to make load generation balance report not, since 1978. I remember the format was known. Percentage forced outage, partial outage dependable year, <clears throat> auxiliary consumption, N minus one, everything was streamlined. But then what happened? Then came market. The moment market came, the question was, how much would you have? How much would you buy? How much would you build? That itself, you know, uh, disturbed our apple cart. And uh, then came the renewables. And uh, we were used to tameable resources. They would listen to our instruction. Now nobody listens to the operator's instructions. And that is the challenge. And that is why we need resource adequacy. Uh, planning exclusively for peak demand is obsolete. For half a century, we have worked on energy requirement, know the load factor, divide it, come to the uh, peak load, and then meet the peak load through uh, load duration curve. This was all so ingrained in our bone marrows. And now the generation has suddenly become whimsical. So numbers, you know, we used to have loss of load probability, 0.2%, loss of load expectation, loss of load hours, uh, energy, unserved energy, <clears throat> then uh, expected demand not served, expected energy not served. All these terminologies and theoretical formulations are well known and we are taught. Our national security policy way back in 2005 set 5% as reserve. One in 10, from where it came, I don't know, but all the power system engineers, uh, you know, they remember one in 10, that also came. But now, now the question is, what is the cost of the new entry? What is the value of lost load? All such things have become important now, more important, I would say. As Mr. Prashad mentioned, our problem is even more complex uh, because of uh, one single grid and uh, uh, diversity in India varies from 5% to 15%. And it can sometimes, uh, in the seasonality, it can go up to 20 25%. And we need to derive strength out of this. We need to live from, we need to borrow from EU, from everywhere else in the world. So a few questions I will raise uh, because uh, where will I get such opportunities? Why should we have such high level of uh, uh, reliability numbers? Do we really need it? One in 10? Uh, Indians are frugal. We are flexible. Give me 50% uh, cheaper. I don't mind two in 10. So this is one question which uh, have a serious uh, concerned about it. The other part is the demand response. It has to be part of our equation. Megawatt is extremely important. Uh, we cannot afford to build, keep on building for 1% of 1% of the last, uh, you know, who's 
utilization factor will be very low. So that's one thing. Uh, being a federal structure, state areas, control areas, distribution, layers within layers, nested loops, uh, then regions within re all these complexities are there. And uh, Mr. Prashad also explained, it's very clear to us. It cannot be uh, decentralized or centralized. It has to be decentralized and centralized. We need to have the responsibility from the bottom and then supervision from the top and somewhere they meet. Of course, it's not very easy to arrive at that, how much in reserve we should share and uh, how much one should be allowed to depend on the market. That remains a question. But one of the very important point, which I have heard from Europeans, but uh, I would like to know further on this and uh, read more on this is, what should be the import capability as a policy for every state? We have one grid. Somebody can say that I will depend on the full market. Would the regulator allow or would the regulator say that, no, you cannot depend on the market at all. Show me 100%. Their answer must be lying somewhere in between, but that will decide the number. For example, uh, our average median, if you take 70% import capability, many of the states have. Some average will come out to somewhere around 50%. But some of the states have only 10%, 15% import capability or export capability. They would be in trouble even after they have met all the resource adequacy is my gut feeling which comes out. But these numbers have to come out of this. Then the other part is in a capacity credit, ELCC, which we talked about, we know wind or solar, uh, solar will be 5%, will be around 20 to 25%. This has to get into the head of everyone from operator to policymakers that you need probably five times uh, of uh, firm capacity if you are adding renewables. Capacity credit, again, I would say that we should have capacity credit duration curve. One number always frightens me. So like dual duration curve, capacity credit duration curve, all kinds of a duration curve should be available. So the policymakers can take a call. Where is the most optimal one? That's another one. Of course, we talked about uh, uh, you know tools and data. I mean, I fully echo that. That's a serious problem. In theory, everything uh, is fine, but in practice, you get into real trouble. The skill set and human resources, no less important. You know, you can make the, somebody understand the entire theory, but when it comes to real implementation, many unknowns and uh, cleaning of data, validating and then visualizing long-term things are tough. You, you need battery of uh, uh, experts to do that. And, uh, you know, the problem is that it's not one or two. It's an eight, seven, six, zero hours, or if not every 15 minute simulation. So the integrity and probity of the entire simulation process is also very important. And how do we visualize that? So I, I would, uh, you know, uh, gather courage to say that I stopped looking at the numbers long back started looking at the graphs. Now I don't like looking at the graphs. I want to look at the 3D surface of anything which you talk about so that I know that how smooth is the surface and where are the mischievous and outliers which will put me in trouble. And then I would say that, um, you know, but, uh, what is happening to load? Supply side, over concentration, load side, uh, we are coming with e-mobility, e-cooking, electrolyzer, what will be tameable load, moving load of uh, uh, vehicles? Uh, they can get synchronized anywhere and char get charged anywhere. So what kind of uh, load curve will come? Will the load factor increase or decrease in India? We had a very high load factor because of the shortage. Now it started falling down. But where would it fall and how the load curve will be uh, tamed? And uh, regulators have intervened and we have moved all our load to other side. Agriculture load is coming down, but how much it will come down? Maybe it was 30%, it can come down to 20%. So these are the kind of questions which comes in my mind. And uh, then, of course, solar rooftop uh, and the kind of announcement. So that will change the entire thing. And uh, other part is that neither capacity nor energy is enough. We have capacity, we don't have energy. We have energy, but we don't have corresponding capacity. So that's another aspect. 
and uh, transmission transfer capability assessment becomes very important even for prospective plan not to talk of uh, only uh, thing that's my uh, understanding but i would like to get uh, more information and stand corrected and uh, uh, the assumption that the capacity is built and uh, it will be useful is no more valid and uh, that uh, import dependency as we discussed about it. And uh, storage requirement, again, uh, you know, one needs a duration curve of storage. Uh, how much will give what benefit and uh, other things. Uh, transmission and generation planning correlation has to be understood by the policymakers and regulators and uh, increasing levels of renewables will certainly challenge the reliability and uh, shift during any time of the day. Now the surprises can come any point of time and what kind of a contingencies we uh, factor. So with uh, these little uh, fragmented scattered parts, let me abruptly stop. Thank you. Thank you, Sunny, sir. A lot of thought-provoking questions, which I hope we will be getting back to. Uh, but one aspect that you mentioned was on demand response. And uh, I think uh, we have a speaker here, Christine, who will be following up. And uh, let, let, let's go a bit to the European Union uh, side. And Christine, so I invite you to please come in and share your insights. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. Thank you for organizing this webinar and for having me. Um, and thanks to the previous speakers for already raising some interesting uh, points that, as you say, I can uh, probably pick up on. I did prepare two slides to get my points across, so I will try to quickly share them into the webinar. If not, I can also just do as my previous speakers did. Yeah, so now you can see them in non-screen mode. And now I imagine you can see them in full screen mode. Can you confirm that? Mm. Yeah, seems like it. Okay, so let me just quickly directly switch to the first one. Um, I mean, we've already, uh, since we dialed into this webinar, we probably have an idea of what resource adequacy is or should be. And we've heard some uh, thoughts on what are the relevant elements. So this is really just an overview hyper um, at the center here. Um, we have, I want to bring across this vision, uh, when we talk about resource adequacy, we often think about balancing demand and supply and so on, but I want to add this perspective that it's really also about balancing uh, uncertain and intermittent elements and reliable and dispatchable elements. Of course, if we had no uncertain or intermittent elements, then all of them would be dispatchable, and therefore we wouldn't really have so much concerns about resource adequacy rather than uh, just whether demand matches supply. But um, it really becomes more of an issue the more uncertain and intermittent things are. And uh, unfortunately, in that respect, that is what a low carbon energy system generally entails, more uncertain, more intermittent elements. And that's why we're more concerned now with resource adequacy than we used to be. And then uh, usually we have these at least two different perspectives in there where we look at the short term. So given the capacities and the things that we've already built, um, or that we will have built at a certain point in time in the future, will those be sufficient and adequately managed to uh, really uh, match at any point in time? But then also taking the longer term perspective where we really want to adjust the capacity mix and the elements in the system in order to uh, balance between some uncertain and some uh, reliable elements. Now for uncertain uh, uh, elements and intermittent elements, we can have things to balance like forecast errors, equipment failure, and maybe some supply chain disruptions as we have experienced quite painfully in Europe in the past couple of years. And then in the long term, we could be we could be looking at some plants being retired and too many or not, not enough other plants uh, being invested and started up at the same time. Um, we also have quite some concerns about how demand levels are evolving, at what level in general, but also what kind of profiles we're going to see from new type of, types of demands in the future. Um, and then we have some, from a resource adequacy, quite unsettling developments regarding uh, prosumers. Essentially, suddenly uh, users of the system uh, start doing what they want and not what we are used to them doing. Um, and also some kind of decentral backup uh, uh, considerations, which essentially um, make it more uncertain what kind of energy demands are being met from the overall system or decentrally. Um, those would be the uncertain elements that we want to, uh, to balance out. And then we have 
thankfully also a toolbox of dispatchable elements available to sort of match those. And in the short term, of course, we can talk about dispatchable generators. Um, you've mentioned uh, uh, beforehand how previously people used to listen to the system operator when they were told to dispatch. That's obviously a very nice scenario for resource adequacy and it's not that much the case anymore. Um, the more we have markets and the more we have uh, uh, yeah, flexible and interruptible uh, players. But um, sort of in exchange for that, we have this new group of uh, dispatchable uh, elements in the system, and this would be flexible and interruptible loads. So um, especially historically, we didn't really think about loads as something that we would also dispatch, steer, and, and control. The load was the given factor that was supposed to be met. Um, and this notion is, is crumbling the more we move to a low carbon energy system just because of the sheer necessity of it. I think even in uh, previous energy systems, loads have been to some extent flexible and it could have been interrupted. And there's sort of a discrete uh, function of values of lost loads so that some loads could actually have been shed or moved at a relatively low cost. We just didn't make use of that because we didn't need to. But uh, now that the framework is changing, this is becoming more and more uh, of a concern that we should, if there is some uh, possibility to shift loads, we should make use of that. Um, in the short term, obviously, now we also increasingly have storage capacity available to, uh, to increase adequacy. And then in the long, long term, of course, we want to make sure that uh, there's some reserve and peak capacity available. It can be generation uh, mostly. Um, there's a lot to be done about interconnection capacity, sort of sharing resor uh, reserve and peak capacities across regions, so we don't need to have them uh, available just for this one region that we're talking about. Um, and increasingly in the long term, I, I think that we will uh, also be thinking about restrict restricted connection agreements. So both generators, intermittent generators and uh, flexible loads will uh, already in their agreements where they uh, attach themselves to the system uh, accept some kind of rules that their supply can be interrupted, can be controlled to a certain extent. And it's, I think, yeah, it's, it's those two elements that are highlighted in red that I want to uh, focus on with my next point, and that's also already my last point, at least for these initial thoughts. Um, looking at uh, demand flexibility a bit more, because all these other elements, I feel there are more and more standard. It's really just a question of how do we calculate them? How do we uh, um, how do we know uh, how to how to make the right modeling in order to uh, um, plan them out for the future? But with the demand flexibility, I would say we have a bit of a more tricky uh, challenge here. Because um, we have on the one hand the technologies that put them up here, we have some industrial processes that are flexible, we could have commercial heating and cooling that can to some extent um, uh, react to uh, adequacy challenges. We have heat pumps both on the individual level and pooled, for example, in a district heating system. And we also have uh, prominently electric vehicles, both individual and in fleets, that can to some extent be uh, controlled uh, or it can react to the adequacy needs of the system. But the problem really is, and that is also what uh, I think, Mr. Suni, you have nicely put from the system operator perspective, that uh, it's very hard to get a good idea and some trust as to how reliable a resource this will be in the future, because it's, it's thinkable that we will all um, use our electric vehicles differently because of an adequacy need. But if we plan for five years ahead, 10 years ahead, we really want to be sure because if it doesn't happen in the end, then we would have rather built another power plant and that would have been there for us to rely on. So there is a lot of, uh, yeah, a lot of additional factors than just having the technology ready in the system here because this is distributed and because it uh, interacts with a lot of other frameworks. And I've put this here as the regulatory, societal, and political framework, where on the one hand, we would be looking at some kind of contracts um, for curtailment and limited capacity in order to really lock in that this uh, flexibility that we can see on the demand side um, would really be available because this is contractually fixed. I mean, this in general, or in, in, in theory, this also applies to decentralized uh, generation where you could curtail uh, wind or solar generation, but I'm just uh, focusing on the demand side here. So also for the demand, especially for industrial and commercial demands, it seems very uh, feasible to just assess with the businesses, what kind of uh, reliability do they really need? And then only contract the type and the level of uh, reliability um, that is actually needed. And then also only build the adequacy 
from the other elements that is actually required to match the specific requirements of this demand. Uh, of this demand. And in order to uh, then embed this properly, there's also a need to have some kind of ambitious flexibility in policy and planning scenarios. Because um, if the planning scenarios just focus on um, adequacy in the traditional way, in the reliable technical way, then the flexibility will always only be an add-on. If we don't start trusting it on it and planning for it, that means it's not considered. Then we will always have some kind of interconnection capacity or uh, a plan capacity to back it up anyways. And therefore the need or the pressure to really deliver on the flexibility side is not there. So it's a bit of a chicken and egg uh, problem where from the policy side, I think there's a statement to be made uh, some commitment that they're actually counting on the flexibility and this will then also be a signal to those who develop um aggregation scheme and business models around this that that this is going to be uh this is going to be supported from the political side um obviously there's a, a large case to be made about market rules that should be suitable for distributed actors and for active demands there's a lot of hurdles i'm, I'm speaking mostly for europe there's a lot of hurdles um for the demand side to participate adequate, adequately in the uh, in the system, and therefore a lot of the capacity or the, the potential for the, for flexibility isn't used yet. Planners look at this and they say, "Well, it's not even used. We don't even use the flexibility capacity that we have right now. So how should we trust that we're going to use more of it in the future?" Um, again, the market rules need to be there first in order for the trust to come later, um, and then. This also speaks to, uh, again, what you said, Mr. Sonny, about, uh, you said, I think you, I remember you said, uh, Indians are frugal and flexible, right? So I, I, I like that statement because I feel that, especially in the context of looking beyond Europe, we have this uh, uh, opportunity that because customers uh, or electricity users aren't yet so spoiled and used to a full-time, no worries supply from the plug, as in the Western world we have established in the past, we now have this chance that you don't even get them used to that in the first place, but establish um, with knowledge building and sort of empowering different actors to really uh, establish an electricity supply mentality, if you will. That doesn't mean that you have less of a, a standard of living or less of a, a business environment for, for your commercial activities, but you really just incorporate an adequacy uh, thinking into new energy and electricity uses that come on board in the future. And then you can actually get ahead of Europe in, in that sense, because we now need to retrain some of our electricity customers to accept uh, and, and get used to intermittent uh, contracts and curtailment in the future. Whereas you can maybe just skip that step and establish that that is what, uh, what is the best for the system in the first place. And with that, I will close my, my thoughts. Thank you very much. Thank you, Christine. I think we're already getting some uh, questions on the, the demand side uncertainties that you highlighted here. But uh, before we get into that, and um, Yasser, if you allow me, Mr. Prasad has to leave. So I would actually quickly like to take maybe a few questions which have been directed to him, and then uh, I'll ask you to take the stage. Um, so sorry for that. Uh, but Mr. Prasad, uh, I know you have another meeting and you'd be uh, you know, jumping out of this call in another 15 minutes. So I thought I'll take the opportunity to address some of the questions which have been put forth. Um, so there's one uh, where uh, Mr. Mishra is asking about how demand. So draft resource uh, guidelines suggest 70% pr procurement should be in long term, 10 to 20% in medium and remaining is to be met by a short term procurement. Uh, which is approximately the same that DISCOMs are already doing. So he asks, however, the long-term PPAs are not yet happening on ground other than RE through SECI. Would this affect ensuring procurement profile going forward? Any quick response? I, I think he has not uh, understood the entire resource adequacy framework properly. Mm -hmm. There are two elements of tying up of the power in what we have mentioned in the guidelines. <clears throat> One is the resource adequacy for their own purpose. And one is the resource adequacy at the time when the national peak is occurring. So there are two different times it will be happening in each of the, I mean, for each of the discounts. So when the national peak is happening, at that time, he has to tie 100% of the power. 
no, I mean, nobody can say that I have not tied up this power to meet the national corresponding to the national peak demand. So whatever is their contribution, they will have to tie up the entire 100% of that power. The leverage has already been given in case of meeting their own demand, which might be occurring at a different point of time. Okay. So by this, what we are trying to do? We are trying to see that the whenever national peak demand is occurring, that means that's the highest resource that my country needs. And if I'm if everybody has 100% tied up that capacity, that means I'll ensure that the demand is met. At any other time, the demand will be lesser than the peak demand and the capacity is already there with me. So that can be used. And the surplus capacity will be with somebody and deficit capacity with some other person. So this can be traded or exchanged. And what Mr. Sony was telling, market development will happen like this one. No okay. leverage. Yeah, there's another follow-up question uh, where, uh, so whether resource adequacy study has to be annual exercise for DISCOM SLDC, whether they need to set up permanent IT infrastructure, and if any support would be made available to them under the PSDF. For IT infrastructure, we have been harping all the DISCOMs for quite some time. It's not now. They, every every DISCOM must have an IT vertical because now everything is all IT driven and we can't think of having an organization which is not having an IT vertical. That's number one. Second, second, what, second question, what was the initial part? Yes. Sorry. Uh, so whether the, uh, the, uh, the resource adequacy study has to be annual exercise for DISCOM and SLDC. Uh, yeah, come. <laughs> yes, it has to be an annual exercise. They can't now wish away by saying that I have done a planning for five years or 10 years and not revising it every time. So DISCOM definitely will have to carry out every year and which in any case they will have to demonstrate before the state commission. And state commission will do a due diligence on, on that as well. But for day-to-day -day activities, the load dispatch centers will have to do that exercise every day. For intraday, day ahead, week ahead, month ahead, quarter, and up to an year. So they must, it will be the responsibility of the load dispatch center to ensure that the adequate resources have been tied up. Thank you. Uh, I think one aspect uh, was uh, he asked if there's any support which would be made available um, under PSDF. I assume it was linked to the IT infrastructure point. IT infrastructure, I think if what you require is the manpower and the setup. What what else you require? And I don't see that any any discom or any discom has asked for a support uh, on on that account. It's a it's an organizational thing which any discoms must do it. Right. Uh, so I think maybe one last question before you have another 10 minutes. So uh, how this resource adequacy exercise is different from load generation balance report study happening on, happening each year and also the study happening under long term medium generation and load forecast study. So basically he's asking the difference. The difference is the dynamism, number one. Number two, what I mentioned is is now you have to see each and every factor in it. I think Mr. Sony was trying to get into those those uh, terminologies, whether it was LOLP or energy not serve or or capacity credit and everything. All those jargons, which I'll not mention, re-mention now, but they are supposed to be factored in, and they have to be rightly understood. It's not only saying that I have run a model, got a number, and that number is blindly accepted. No. You have to see it in perspective. You have to see with respect to your own requirement and try to make your judgment. That is more important. And that is how now we are saying is it has to be, it has to be a dynamic exercise wherein everybody or everyone who is involved in the entire value chain has to be involved throughout. And every day it has to be done. Thank you, Mr. Prasad. Uh, there's another question, if you allow me. Um, in our draft resource adequacy framework, have we given any weightage to economic and financial considerations to reliability criteria? Economic considerations are taken care of when we are doing the demand.
the econometric method and in the econometric method we do take care of the uh, of the all the uh, financial parameters okay um would you have time for more questions or uh... quick maybe another one or two minutes okay okay great thank you so um uh, of course, like at a later stage, we can also have other panelists react to these questions. I'm sorry, uh, because Mr. Prasad has to leave, we thought it would be good to have his insights uh, in here. So uh, I apologize to the other panelists and thank you for your patience. Um, so we have a question which says, uh, how can we better train the system to flatten the load curve so that we do not overbuild the system to meet the peak demand and optimally meet the off peak? I think uh, what Mr. Sony was mentioning is I don't now care for the <laughs> graph. <laughs> and same goes here as well. Now it's all analogous, nothing digital. So each and every instant of time, I must see that it happens. Right? So mm -hmm. that's, that's the kind of granularity that we are now going to achieve. Right. So I think in regard to the granularity, there's also a question uh, focusing on the decentralized solutions that we're looking at. So the question is, can decentralized solutions contribute significantly towards making us resource adequate? If yes, how? I mean, absolutely, absolutely, that will happen. And, and that we are also focusing on it. You must have seen recently that we have made a DRE, that means uh, uh, rooftop solar and other, a specific obligation under the renewable purchase obligation and this will be coming from the distributed including solar rooftops this will help this will definitely help and this will definitely uh, give me a uh, leverage in terms of lesser requirement from the transmission and distribution network right? so i think mr prasad probably the last question linked to this decentralized uh, uh, uncertainties that we're talking about there's a question which asks that what are your recommendations on dealing with uncertainties in demand pattern changes due to uncertainties in growth in DRE, presumers, EV, um, and the technological changes that we've been talking about in the panel discussion so far. So how do we deal with these demand pattern Un uncertainties? Uncertainties are broadly will be taken care of because now, as I mentioned to you, I'm, and again, I'm mentioning it that we don't want to wait for things to happen, but we would like to be updated or updated almost every day and at least on a longer time horizon at least every year so that's the kind of thing that we'll be trying to and this will take care of all my uncertainties uncertainty by that i mean is so for example i had thought that so much ave is likely to come and it has not come or the other way around it has come but it has come in a larger number so both situations have to be dealt in a in a larger manner say for example even even uh Recently, or recent few months, if you see, the demand growth has gone even 20 per, 20%, more than 20%. We have immediately factored in that and revised our NEP. You will very soon see a notification coming out uh, from Government of India, revised construct of the entire next 10 years plan. So we are now dynamic. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you for taking the time out and joining us today. And as I mentioned, we will be getting back to some of these points which uh, Mr. Prasad raised and the questions that have been put forth. Please keep the questions coming. And now I go back to Yasser. Uh, thank you for being so patient. And uh, Yasser, the floor is all yours. I think a lot has been said and it would be interesting to see it from a modeling perspective on how do we bring in all these multiple aspects of resource adequacy into a model utilizing the data and kind of uh, you know helping us with resource adequacy planning over to you yasir i think yeah hello can you hear me yes we can hear you now maybe you can make it in presentation mode you can see your screen uh, can you see my screen yeah we can but it's not in presentation mode would you like to yeah Is it okay now? Uh, I think for me, it's uh, yeah, perfect, perfect. Please go ahead. Okay. Um, hello from my side to um, all the speakers and also to all the participants. 
Uh, I am Yasser Tohidi. I work for uh, NSOE. NSOE is a European Association for uh, Cooperation of Transmission System Operators um, in Europe. Um, which, uh, well, uh, we, uh, NSOE has several uh, mandates, uh, but uh, the main point is to uh, uh, collect data, co uh, making the cooperation between the TSOs and uh, in order to make sure that the European uh, targets are uh, met uh, uh, accordingly. Um, in, this, in this presentation, I will focus mainly on ERA, which is one of the products uh, at NSOE, which is also uh, an, an, an uh, adequacy product. Um, and to put it into the context, uh, I created this slide that uh, says uh, how, uh, where the era fits in the uh, high level uh, European uh, targets and regulations. So we have clean energy package, uh, which uh, sets uh, the, the rules for uh, European um, energy sector uh, in order to uh, be compliant with Paris Agreement. So it has its own targets of, uh, for example, on, uh, on, on efficiency, on uh, build, uh, uh, buildings, um, energy consumption, on um, renewable integration, et cetera. For renewable integration, it uh, has a target to reach 30 uh, 32% by 2030, and also we have the net zero energy, uh, uh, net zero carbon uh, neutrality uh, for, for 2050. So it has several targets, and also it says uh, the, the rules for uh, different uh, associations in order to make sure these targets are met. And um, two important um, uh, regulations uh, which are mentioned and are relevant to our discussions are CONE, VOL, RS, which stands for Cost of New Entry, Value of Lost Load, and Reliability Standard Methodology, which should be done by each member state, and also the ERA, European Resource Adequacy Assessment, which is a, which is a product mandated to NSOE. Um, <clears throat> And these two uh, products go hand in hand. Um, how? Um, well, the 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 the, uh, the era is uh, not exclusively used in this uh, way that I mentioned in this slide, but this is one of the uh, main usage of era, which is that uh, um, um, using the result of era as a European resource adequacy assessment for. Uh, member states who want to apply for capacity mechanisms. So if uh, if uh, if uh, uh, error shows that there is adequacy concern in certain member states, first they have to uh, make sure that they address the regulatory distortions, and second they can apply for capacity mechanism, but in the condition that they have already done the first uh, the Conevol and RS, so they have defined. Um, the reliability standard uh, in this methodology according to the uh, requirements and the uh, definitions of uh, this uh, uh, methodology. And of course, it's, it, this adequacy concern, as I said, should have been identified in error. Uh, I will uh, explain what, how and where these two products are uh, connected. Um, and also uh, I come back to some references to this green energy package uh, later on. Um, in a European level, how different uh, adequacy, um, 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 how, how the adequacy is seen, how the system is planned, basically, you can see in this slide, so we have a uh, 10 year network development plan, which is a product um, uh, uh, for, for each two years. And, it's, and it looks at uh, lo longer than 10 years. So here we, we look at the policy decisions. Here we look at more uncertain futures, so more scenarios for the future. 
and uh, uh, it uh, basically um, uh, results to uh, 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 the, the the best optimal transmission plan for uh, for for the scenarios that are considered. And then we have ERA, which looks at one to ten years ahead. And uh, here, uh, considering uh, uh, the uncertainties, of course, when you come closer to real time, the uncertainties decrease. So here, uh, we don't have the scenarios, for example, that was under investigation in TYNDP, but here we have also uh, uncertainty scenarios regarding the, uh, the, the uh, the temperature, uh, so the climatic uh, scenarios, etc. And here in this step, basically the generation investment decisions are uh, looked at and uh, are uh, analyzed in order to see um, how that will affect uh, the uh, adequacy uh, level of uh, member states and Europe in general. Then we have seasonal outlook. So this becomes closer to the real time. Um, 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 so uh, some, some of the uncertainties decrease, but also when you go closer to real time, um, the, the, the model that we create is becoming more uh, accurate, let's say, in terms of, uh, uh, because some of the uncertainties are already realized. For example, some of the uh, uh, maintenance is planned better. So also some of the uh, hydro uh, targets are uh, uh, are modeled uh, with more detail in this uh, in this study. And then we have uh, and then we have uh, uh, basically uh, weekly uh, close to real time again adequacy uh analysis done by rscs which are uh, which are several in europe and they are uh, coordinating um uh the, the, the regional security issues uh and uh in in in, in closer uh, regions uh in, in cooperation with TSOs in clo closer closer uh, regions in europe um now I will uh, more focus on ERA itself. So what is ERA? Um, first, we have um, uh, data. Of course, it's very important. It has to be um, uh, coming from uh, the member states, from TSOs, and it has to be um, compliant with the uh, uh, national uh, energy and climate plans, which are also another uh, uh, another requirement set by clean, clean energy package. Um, um, so in terms of the data that we collect for performing uh, ERA, we have an European market modeling database. So this is the, the, all the detailed data about generation capacities. Um, uh, unit by unit, um, and uh, the data about different uh, technical parameters that these units have. Um, we have uh, we have to model the network as accurate as possible. There are two ways NTCs that has that uh, has been used uh, until last year, let's say in in era but we are uh, uh, moving uh, for completely to flow-based. Uh, this year, flow-based is the approach uh, that is used also in the market uh, in Europe uh, to model a transmission system in a transparent way and also uh, uh, respecting the bidding zone definitions um, uh, in, the electricity, in the internal electricity market of Europe. And then we have climatic data coming from Pan-European climate, data, cl climate Database, which uh, basically creates our scenarios for climate, uh, our climate scenarios uh, on, uh, on capacity factors of wind and solar and uh, hydro uh, inflows um, and also on temperature profiles. And then 
separate from this, we have, well, not completely separate because temperature and also the, some of the data from PMMDB is used in our demand forecasting tool, which also creates um, scenarios um, for the demand. All of this data is, um, is given to EV, EVA step. So this is a step that investment decisions are revised. So basically uh, we do an economic viability assessment on generation capacities um, in order to see which of them are viable to stay in the market or not, or uh, uh, um, which new resources uh, might come to the market. So here our input or our economic parameters, as I mentioned in the previous slide, well, in the first slide about the Conevol and RS. So here is the connection between the, the two, the two uh, studies, uh, uh, the two methodologies. So here for economic parameters, we use, for, uh, we use uh, the, the data from uh, Conevol and RS uh, uh, study in terms of uh, VAG, CAPEX, uh, fixed cost, and also the, uh, the new entries uh, that we consider in each member state as a, as a candidate uh, for expansion. Um, uh, in addition to that, um, from PMMDB, from TSOs, we collect other uh, parameters about the units, like if they are policy technologies, so we, they are, uh, uh, they are, uh, 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 they are uh, used as uh, as other uh, for, for for other requirements, so they are protected uh, uh, from uh, decommissioning, let's say, and also uh, some other uh, parameters. So all of these inputs are created and given to the model, and then we run a ten year uh, horizon a ten year horizon uh, expansion uh, long term model. Um, at this step, it's a one-shot model. So the uh, uh, uncertainty on climatic scenarios should be modeled as a stochastic um, um, modeling approach. Uh, so it means uh, this is a huge model. So we cannot uh, uh, look at every climatic scenario. So we have to have a pre-process step of selecting representative climatic years by clustering them and giving some weights to them. And uh, after running this model, we have uh, um, the result, which as I said, is the, um, well, it revises basically the data that we collect from TSOs and we find some units not, uh, not viable. So, or uh, we think that uh, in 10 years ahead, for example, uh, certain capacities are uh, is, is very uh, attractive to, uh, uh, to to be invested and come to the market. So um, after uh, after doing uh, this step, the economic viability assessment, then we enter to the final uh, step of uh, calculation of adequacy uh, levels in each member state member step member state, and uh, this is our economic dispatch model. So here we have, uh, we are not uh, restricted, let's say, by the bulkiness of the model. So here we can, because you, you can run ev everything separately. It's not like previous step that has to be one single big long-term model. So here we can have a lot of, uh, oh, we, can, we, we can have um, much more climatic scenarios. We can have, uh, scenarios representing the random outages of um, uh, generation units and uh, transmission plants. So we can create uh, uh, many uh, scenarios and we do the economic dispatch um, for each target year of our model for this, uh, according for, for, for each of these scenarios. Um, and the result of uh, this is uh, finally, um, our adequacy metrics, um, which is basic the, the, the which is basically the loss of load expectation and um, expected uh, energy not served. So 
this final adequacy metric, if I want to put it into context of the first slide, we had the reliability standard. So here, uh, the low layer calculation uh, for each member state, member state, if it's, uh, so, so here it's interesting to look at if it's higher than the uh, reliability standard, then um, it has to be complemented, as I said, by looking at the uh, regulatory distortions. And also it, it can be complemented by national studies in order to see where, uh, w what is the concern here. And if everything is, uh, cleared in this uh, further uh, assessments then that country can be can that member state can apply for capacity mechanisms as i said um so yeah um that's it that's era uh, thank you thank you yasser uh, i think it was very interesting to know the nitty-gritties of the era process and uh, i think at this point of time i would really like uh, mr suni if you could come in and uh, probably what what are your thoughts on kind of what yasser suggested to what extent is india implementing something on those lines do we need to change certain things are we in the right direction um just your reaction to this Suni, sir when we need all these things it's, uh, I mean, it doesn't cost much, as uh, Mr. Prashad also mentioned. After all, we have tools, we have people, and uh, uh, coming out with these numbers is always a good practice. And now, in practice, in whether the policymakers will be influenced by which one is a secondary question. So I would say that we should have everything, VOLL, CONE, LOLH, LOLP, DNSS, EN, everything should be there. Then we will see what to take, what to not take, where tinkering is required, what parameter is costing how much, and then the decisions can be taken. But as far as the intrinsic capacity building is concerned, we must be ahead of the curve. Thank you. Thank you, Sunis. I completely agree. Uh, I think uh, I would also go back to some of the questions as promised, because at that point of time, uh, we could only ask... Uh, uh, Mr. Prasad to react, but uh, uh, okay. Firstly, I think Yasser, there's a question uh, uh, by somebody asking, is the ERA model a capacity expansion model? The, the ERA as a whole, no, but the EVA part, yes, that's exactly the um, capacity expansion model. So the, the middle step where um, the model a 10 year uh, long term uh, planning uh, mathematical model uh, yeah mm -hmm. it's a fast expansion and the result is as i said um, viability of the units yes or no and also viability of existing units and also what about uh, expanding uh, new units in the system if needed thanks uh, can i just add uh, uh, i wanted to ask you about this transition from planning happening at the member state level to the EU level, um, can you can you maybe shed some light on how European Union has kind of uh, you know gone through that process? Because as Sunisa mentioned earlier, for like Indian states are almost equivalent to EU member states, and we're looking at our planning process. So even from a modeling perspective, when you talk about all of these different data points. Any challenges, any anything that you can highlight on on this transition um, that you went through in expanding the uh, modeling for resource adequacy planning? Yeah, it's a um, it's a good question, um, and uh, I'm not sure if I'm the best person to answer it, but I will try. So, uh, as I said, there is uh, these targets defined in the European level, and also these targets uh, should be translated uh, in uh, according, um, so, 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 so these targets should be translated uh, in, in national level by national um, NECP, National Energy and Climate Plan. So um, um, uh, there are uh, rules uh, for member states to be compliant uh, with this. Um, so the data that we receive, we assume that it's um, compliant uh, with those targets uh, and with the, uh, the the related planning of uh, member states according to that target. 
So this is the data we see, but of course we do um, a public consultation on the data um, in order to make uh, everybody uh, have a look and uh, uh, bring in their concerns if it's not in line with the the with the planning of member states of, or if that uh, planning is uh, not um, in, in line with the targets. So we do uh, some back and forth um, discussion with TSOs uh, in order to correct this if there is a major issue. Um, and then we do our error on top of that. Thank you so much. Uh, so, uh, Christine, uh, some of the previous questions uh, which I uh, asked Mr. Prasad, I think uh, it would be interesting to kind of, uh, uh, you know, see your reaction to those as well. Um, so, uh, one of the questions was that what are your recommendations on dealing with uncertainties in demand pattern changes due to uncertainties in growth in DRE? And another one um, asked on how can we better train the system to flatten the load curve so that we do not overbuild the system to meet the peak demand and optimally meet the off-peak. So, uh, Christine, would you like to comment on that? Yeah, um, I will try. <laughs> so, <laughs> maybe just start with the last one regarding the flattening the load curve. Um, I mean, when we talk about the actual system peak, that, that is a thing, we want to flatten it, but um, uh, I want to be a bit cautious about flattening load as a general objective, because while we're dealing with a system where we have intermittent generation, there could be some times where we also have a generation peak. And so long as we can transmit this energy, there's no need to flatten. And that's also why when we talk about uh, incentives to make consumers have a more flat consumption, either individually or as a consumer group, um, we have to be careful to not overdo it and give them uh, incentives to be very flat in a sense that never exceed a certain capacity and never uh, and potentially even have the same constant consumption all the time. From a system operation perspective, that's not necessarily desirable. There could be situations where we actually can deal with a, a peak and then any framework that we set up to incentivize demand could also uh, or should also potentially uh, allow for consumers to actually match a peak in generation, as I said, so long as it can be uh, transmitted and distributed in the system. And that's why, um, uh, I mean, also my, my research focuses a lot on tariff structures, it has focused a lot on tariff structures, and then you have a lot of tools available to, for example, have a tariff for a consumer, it could be individual consumer, private consumer, or an industrial consumer to say, your contract stipulates you cannot exceed a certain demand overall. It's like your fuse capacity or some kind of capacity limit and then that means from that perspective you can be sure that this consumer will not exceed this demand because maybe technically it's not even possible or there would be a high penalty to exceeding it but then if you want to integrate this same consumer in some kind of balancing scheme or in a redispatch situation then um, you, you would have to make sure that in the end they can actually exceed it if it is desirable from the uh, from the system perspective and then if you already incorporate that thought that you might need them to match a peak a generation peak at some point you might not want to give them such a strict contract in the first place but have a more dynamic signal that they react to on the other hand if you have very dynamic signals then you will have, especially at the private level, some consumers who can't actually handle this. And then the question is, are they linked to some kind of aggregator, a digital solution that does that for them? Then maybe they can handle the uh, complicated uh, signal after all. Or if, the, if it's a commercial or industrial consumer, you can assume that they have some procurement department who's going to incorporate and implement something, uh, something feasible to actually work with the very uh, complicated or well, complicated, complicated from the perspective that otherwise you would just be doing what you want with your electricity, um, uh, th then you could have a setup where they can actually handle this kind of complexity. And therefore, just the, the easy target of flattening the curve and also for everyone with one instrument, that's probably not what we're getting. We really have to embrace the diversity of those demand response uh, options that we have and then have targeted solutions for all of them. But um, and then leading to the first question, which I think, which I think was on how reliable, how can we like how, how much uh, demand response can we actually rely on? I think a good way to start is to rely on what we think we can contract, even in the uh, mid or long term or something like that. Because um, if you are um, 
if you have some kind of uh, decentralized distributed tariff response where because the market price is high now you expect consumers to consume less that's something that will probably happen and over time you will build some experience and some confidence as to how much of that you can expect in a certain system maybe also given on the technology mix that you have in that system but uh, regardless of that, when you talk about uh, adequacy and we don't yet have that experience, it's a lot about what kind of contracts do we have. If we have a contract where a certain, say, industrial consumer um, commits that within their production schedules, they are able to uh, shed load for a day or something like that, or sort of re reschedule their production processes if they know a week in advance that it will be necessary or something like that. And, and the contract clarifies that. And that, I would assume, is a resource, a demand resource that we can actually rely on. And then you can also incorporate a penalty for violating that contract, which would cover whatever is your alternative option to still keep the system running if that doesn't happen. And, and this then I would consider, but I just might disagree, uh, a relatively reliable uh, resource from the contract side. And then other resources that are more uh, yeah, decentralized, more uh, uh, implicit, they can come on top based on the experience um, that we gain with them. And this is why also it's important that you're saying these uh, assessments are redone every year or so because we gain in this experience and we see how some policy framework, some capacity building uh, is working and how we have more resources that we can for the future assessments then also rely on. Thank you, Christine. Um, so we have one more question um, and I, he, asking about the VOLL, um, the survey that I think Yasser, you mentioned. Uh, so it's saying it's estimate, VOLL is estimated through consumer surveys is the question. And uh, he's asking if you can elaborate on the process and what is the periodicity of such surveys? Uh, Yasser, would you like to take this? Um, I, I'm not sure about this. So I'm. Uh, it's, um... Uh, uh, um, uh, uh, surveys uh, uh, for sure are part of the uh, process, uh, uh, but not exclusively. But uh, the, the detail of this, um, um, how this is uh, uh, mentioned in the methodology, I'm not sure. But as I said, uh, this is hand in hand with um, cost of new entry and reliability standard because uh, these three parameters are uh complementing each other and if you change one the others uh also change um but uh um how in exactly in the methodology this is done or how in members each member state uh the calc the estimation of uh, value of loss load and these other parameters are done i'm uh i'm, I'm not the best person to answer this Thank you. Thanks, Yasser. So I think we have actually a lot more questions, but we're running a bit short on time. So I apologize. But uh, what I'll do is try to use these questions and ask the panelists to move towards their uh, concluding remarks as well. So Suni, sir, uh, there's a question. And I, if you could club that with your uh, some concluding remarks as well, which is uh, what, according to Mr. Suni, would be the possible solutions in order of priority? <laughs> Oh, it's a really a challenging one. Uh, but there is no silver bullet, first thing. Uh, we got to do everything starting from data to tools to skill set, have clarity of what kind of uh, reliability criteria you want to adapt, have the capability to simulate, have the rigor of doing things more diligently and then analyze. It doesn't cost much. The amount of money we spent towards capacity expansion, it's the second decimal place which you will spend. Somehow that culture has to come. And uh, uh, we are talking about IT verticals and then funding. What is so great funding? One wrong generator commission, your lifetime capacity building of this can be funded. So I'm very sure that our policymakers besides making good regulations and policies, should also have a companion orders, earmarking the resources uh, for each utility. That first you show me where is your uh, tool, where is your hardware, where are your people, where is your skill set. I think then it will get translated. So uh, uh, that's how I would look at it. Rest all other things, uh, you know, great people like Yasser and Kristen, they will give us 
all kinds of solutions, not a problem at all. Academia is full of uh, solutions, but how do we do that? I have another question to my both co-panelists. Uh, uh, please help me if you can do that. How much should be the transfer capability or transmission import imp export capability of every state? At least some benchmarking, some uh, mandating, uh, because uh, the advantage of entire interconnected system, uh, you, you all know the uh, problem. So is there any reference to that? Thank you, Anyone Sunisa. can take up? Yeah. yeah. Uh, thank you, Sunisa. Thank you so much. Uh, Christine, maybe you could react to Sunisa's question and also club it with your concluding remarks. Yeah. Okay. So I'll go for the question first. Um, I'm, I'm not aware that there is a straight answer to that, but as an academic, I feel very comfortable saying it depends. Um, and I think it would depend on, uh, on the one hand, what kind of uh, system you have, because I mean, for for uh, inter interconnection capacity, we have this general thing that if you have very different types of intermittent resources in different parts of the subcontinent then you would want to interconnect them just to level out the intermittency to some extent. And then uh, that, that is one aspect that gives validity to the thought of uh, interchanging so much. In Europe, we're, thri we're thriving to have ever more interconnection, but I'm not aware that that is necessarily to the same level taken into account when it comes to the adequacy. So it's, it's being used and stipulated a lot in order to uh, uh, make electricity supply cheaper in general, but then when it comes to adequacy, there's still a lot of concerns at the national level where you don't want to, even though we're all very friendly and uh, reliable uh, towards each other, we don't want to rely entirely on our neighbors for that. And then it becomes more of a political question, how uh, you have a build up time of another, I don't know, maybe 10, 15 years for a new power plant. If you find out at some extent that you couldn't rely on your neighbor as much as you thought you could, then that is uh, sort of the time span you have in order to get it right if you didn't uh, react in, in, in other terms. So it's, yeah, I think it's a matter of what your system looks like and what kind of trust you want to stipulate amongst the regions that are interconnected. And then uh, for some kind of closing statement, well, I, I came in here into this webinar waving the flag of demand response, so I'm not going to stop now. Um, I don't necessarily think it is the most important or the, the, the largest uh, tool in the box towards resource adequacy, but I think it's the one that re deserves and requires the most attention at this point because it has been a bit, or yeah, so far it's being a bit overlooked. So I think there's a lot of... Uh, welfare to be lost if we don't address demand uh, response adequacy uh, adequately in this adequacy uh, puzzle. And um, it is a bit tricky to assess. You won't manage to address it in the same ways that you did uh, with other capacities, such as building new plants, building storage facilities, and so on. So you really should get into the, or we all collectively need to get into um, uh, the transactional systems, the political framework, and maybe even societal framework to, to reap this rather than build new expensive capacity um, that we wouldn't need if we also tapped into demand response uh, sufficiently. Yeah, and that's it from my side. Thank you, Christine. I think a lot of discourse going on uh, it, uh, related to demand response in India as well. So I agree with what you said. And Yasser, uh, if you'd like to react to what Suni said, asked and also give your concluding remarks. Thanks. Um, yeah, um, how to, how much, how to use, uh, how to uh, optimally use the transmission uh, connection is an interesting uh, topic. Um, um, I, I mentioned flow-based, so uh, in, in Europe we have uh, bidding zones, so each bidding zone is um, Basically, each country is a bidding zone, except uh, some member states who have uh, more. Um, but then uh, the question is, how do you model the transmission um, for, for your adequacy study? Uh, and considering this bidding zone, how you do it? So we have uh, at core and also in Nordics, we have flow-based. And um, just to um, directly, so, OK, you, you can have a look on these methodologies and see in full detail how the uh, 
capacity for uh, trade is uh, considered um, in this flow base, but we have a rule of, as, as we call it 70% rule. So 70% of uh, cross-border uh, um, uh, lines, uh, cross-border uh, capacities should be available to to the to the market um, 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 but yeah but in this flow based methodology there are uh, more detailed uh, uh, requirements uh, in order to adjust uh, uh, the level that is uh, given uh, to the market if if certain rules are uh, are, are apply are, 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 are not uh, uh, considered are not properly applied but anyways um, uh, this is an interesting thing, uh, and um, uh, uh, you can have uh, on our flow-based methodology, which is the, uh, currently the approach used um, in European internal electricity market. Uh, but um, um, on top of that, uh, I wanted to uh, uh, emphasize more on uh, the data handling and uh, uh, modeling of more and more uh, flexible resources that we have in consumption side. So we have increased our categories of our demand response uh, units in ERA, uh, uh, and we have improved it. We are going to improve it even further because there are more types of uh, flexible resources um, coming into the market. And also, uh, in, in addition to that, again, to the, uh, again about the network. So this is an important uh, part of the modeling. So um, there is a review of bidding zones uh, uh, um, uh, uh, in progress. So uh, and and also the the, uh, the the flow base and also the curtailment sharing, which comes after the flow base, because flow base is um, might result to flow factor competitions, and then. Uh, you need to share the, the curtailed load um, um, to revise that. Uh, again, you can see the further details about this in, in, uh, in the flow-based methodology, etc. Uh, so, uh, and also the climate, the, the global warming effect. So, in our scenarios, uh, we are uh, considering more and more uh, either expanding our uh, climatic scenarios to include more extreme. Uh, scenarios or uh, to use uh, some state of the art uh, 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 models that can uh, um, bring in the effect of uh, global warming into our uh, uncertainty and climate scenarios. Thank you so much, Yasser. Um, Suni, sir, you also have a response from one of our participants on the question uh, that you raised. So maybe we can share that response with you. I'll go back to Shweta. So Shweta, you started with asking with like a lot of questions. So maybe some concluding remarks from your end as well. Thanks, Parul. Uh, I think my concluding remark is that this topic requires a series, uh, a discussion every other week, because as Suni, sir, said, it, it encompasses a mini universe we need to look at the different interlinkages. It, it's not a, a one and zero problem that we're trying to solve. Uh, but maybe a quick reaction to uh, a question that we had uh, in the chat, which is about do we have uh, the modeling tool and how can we sort of build capacity in India? And I think from what Yasser presented, it's clear that there is no perfect tool available ready-made that you can use. Every country would need to customize whatever tools are there to fit in their needs. Uh, including that's what uh, NSOE is doing at their end. So even in the case of India, there is no ready off-the-shelf tool that would give us everything. Uh, the one or one or two that is available are also sometimes uh, prohibitively expensive. So if we need to be able to use it at large scale, we will probably need to develop something a little bit more open access. Uh, that means uh, those of us working on the topic within India, we need to collaborate closely because perfecting a tool such as this for India is a minimum five-year affair. So if anybody tells us that a tool can throw an answer right back at us in six months down the lane, uh, uh, that that's um, it'll give you the answer, but not the right kind of answer. So I think to have a, a India-specific tool, uh, it would require all of us to collectively put our muscles and brains into it. So I think uh, it, it's an ongoing process. And as a consequence of developing such tool uh, would be also us streamlining the data 
uh, which Mr. Sony also rightly flagged. And also, I think Mr. Gansham did uh, bring in the relevance and importance of that. I think standardization of data, data platforms where we can use the right kind of data uh, without it being corrupted uh, through passing of hands to be able to model will give us a much more accurate results. Uh, and as and I think uh, we will need a lot more experts, uh, engineers and economists to be able to use such a tool, uh, both at central and state level to start answering some of the questions flagged here. So I think this is an ongoing uh, uh, um, deliberation that we will have to do, and we, we will be continuing on this topic over the next months uh, as we embark on uh, expanding our own uh, capacity in understanding this topic. So do stay tuned uh, for this. This is just sort of an opening primer on the topic, uh, and you will soon you will hear back from uh, some of us or almost all of us on this topic over the coming months. Uh, so thank you so much. And uh, with that, uh, I would like to uh, close today's session. I think we've gone a little bit over time, uh, but thank you for uh, staying in and listening to us. Uh, we'll come back to you next time with another topic. Uh, hopefully it's on offshore wind. Uh, so do stay tuned and uh, uh, we will keep everyone posted. Have a wonderful afternoon and a, a lovely day for those of you in Europe.